So over the last couple of years, and especially since the start of the pandemic, Dungeons and Dragons has absolutely exploded in popularity. And as amazing as that is, because we're bringing all these new players and new people to be able to experience this incredible game, what that means is there are a lot of people who are looking to be dipping their toes into the game for the first time, and they might not know necessarily where to begin. When you first start playing D&D, you can kind of feel like there's a sort of insurmountable and almost infinite amount of information that you can gather and things that you can learn. And, and as true as that is to a large extent, the reality is that a lot of that information isn't really necessary. And if you're just trying to get into the game for the first time, there's definitely some things that we should be focusing on much more than others to really help you kind of get a really good jump start into the game. So in this video, that is exactly what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be peeling this all the way back to the basics to learn about how you actually play a game of Dungeons and Dragons. So there are going to be a few videos in this series. I don't want any one to be too, too long or overwhelming. So I want to be able to cover uh, a few topics in detail, kind of one at a time to really kind of uh, lay the groundwork firmly to be able to have a great understanding moving forward for the game. So in this video, we're going to be taking a deep dive into the actual structure of a session of Dungeons and Dragons. Right, so before we do get into it, if you are enjoying my channel, if you're enjoying this type of video and you would love to see more of it, please do leave me a sub. It does sincerely help. It is completely free and I appreciate every single one. So first and foremost, I think it's incredibly important to remember that Dungeons and Dragons is a collaborative game. The game exists between you and your friends to be able to create these kind of incredible stories and moments and just to have a great time. It's really important to remember that nothing really should be taken as a kind of like an adversarial uh, sort of way. You're not competing against your, your, your friends. You're not competing against the dungeon master. You are working together to sort of create and have these amazing adventures together. And honestly, as kind of corny and cheesy as that sounds, that really is the reality. And making sure that you and the group that you're playing with have that firm like foundation set can really go a long way to having a smooth and incredible campaign together. So first off, what actually is Dungeons and Dragons? So it is a tabletop role-playing game in that you and your group of companions, you're going to be setting out on going on adventures to be able to slay dragons or find mythical artifacts throughout the world. Whatever the, the sort of narrative and the story of your adventure is kind of inconsequential, whether it's taking place in, you know, some sort of medieval uh, kind of fantasy world or whether it's taking place in space doesn't really matter. They can all be played in this environment, in this, this uh, system, as they're called, of Dungeons and Dragons. So when you sit down to play a game of D&D, you need to sort of separate your players into two distinct groups. Uh, one of the groups is going to be your players. These are going to be the people that are actually going on these adventures and doing all these sorts of tasks and slaying dragons, etc. And the other group is really going to be one person, and that is going to be someone known as the Dungeon Master. And this is the person who's kind of narrating and sort of in control, sort of in the driver's seat of what the adventure really looks like and what the structure is going to be. Again, it's super important to remember that neither of these groups are playing against each other. There is no adversarial context here. The Dungeon Master's primary role is to facilitate the game so the players can have a great experience and the players should be doing the same for the DM. So what does a game actually look like? So the beauty of D&D and what I absolutely love about it is that there's almost no limitations. You, you are sort of set up in this world to be able to do just about anything that you want, anything that you can think of, provided it makes some sort of logical sense, you can at least try to a large extent. The rules of the game, while they do exist and they do have, they do present some kind of limitations, that's not really their ultimate goal. They're really there to create some sort of uh, like guidelines and almost context for your world and for your game moving forward so that things make sort of consistent sense and that you can you know, have some sort of logical trajectory towards everything that's happening. So how exactly are any of these decisions made? How is it decided that you're going to go ahead and kill a dragon? Or what if you're going to go explore the depths of some dungeon beneath the castle? Well, there are three main steps to this decision-making process. And the first one being the dungeon master will describe the scene. The second one being the players will decide what actions they want to take. And the final step is the dungeon master decides how it is resolved. And we're going to be going into each of these three steps in detail here. So the first step in the process is the dungeon master actually describing the scene itself. And this can take many forms. This can be something just as simple as describing the amount of doors that exist in a room to describing this incredibly lush rolling plane with all kinds of wildlife and various creatures strewn about with maybe, you know, some waterfalls off in the distance and a rapidly flowing river down, you know, some portion of these hills. 
all of this can really go into to creating this environment and describing this ambient setting so your players can be sort of bought in and kind of immersed into you know, what the actual world looks and feels like. The DM might mention some key characteristics about maybe a village that you're in or um, maybe just the kind of general ambience, how things are feeling in the environment itself. Is there this kind of like obvious feeling of doom and gloom and, and concern or is, or is everyone kind of milling about being all happy and dancing? Maybe they're in the middle of some kind of a festival, you know? All these kinds of descriptions will really play into to what kinds of decisions that your group might be making. It is important to note that sometimes the, des the descriptions that your DM is going to make might kind of be kind of trying to lead you in a certain direction that might be, describe some kind of uh, you know, scowling creature kind of you know, keeping off to themselves in, in the corner of this otherwise jubilant fair. And that might kind of pique the curiosity of one of your players. Maybe you decide to go over and, uh, and have a conversation with them. And this really blends in perfectly to what the second step in this process is, which is that your players will decide what actions they actually want to take. And an action can be just about anything that you want, from going over to speak with that, that scowling figure in the corner to maybe playing some of the carnival games that are, that are taking place. Any decision can be made either as a group, you guys can make something up together, or you can kind of segment off and do your own individual thing. Maybe someone goes to talk to the creature, someone goes to play a fair game, someone wants to go find the prince in the castle and go have a conversation with them. It doesn't matter who decides to do what, maybe there are certain reasons why one player might want to do something over another, but, but in general this is really just kind of up to you and what piques your curiosity and what you think maybe might lead off to, to something more, uh, more exciting or more in-depth later on. When you're in these kinds of scenarios and you're, you're in these decision-making processes in the game, depending on the type of player that you are, sometimes you might want to be using the first person. You might say, I want to do this or I want to do this, do that. Not everyone will necessarily feel comfortable doing that. They don't really want to. Uh, a lot of times some players will opt for the, the third person saying, you know, my character will do this. My character wants to know or do I see something like that, you know? It's really, really key here that neither of these approaches is necessarily right or wrong. It's entirely up to the, the player's preference and their level of comfort in doing these sorts of things, how they want to proceed with that. And, you know, maybe they will change that style over time and that's, that's totally okay and that's really up to them. And again, that is part of the beauty of the game is that you really have this flexibility to kind of do as you see fit with it and play it the way that you want to. Creativity and, and specificity in what you're actually trying to do are also really important in these kind of moments when you're deciding what you want to do. It is great to encourage your players to be able to kind of think outside the box and do something outside of the norm, but it's also really important to not sort of give them the feeling of being stranded as if there's either so many things to do that they have no idea where to begin or that they have so few things to do they feel so just sort of lost that they don't even know what is possible. And that is sort of a topic for another video on its own. But again, it's just kind of important to encourage that discussion, that kind of conversational flow amongst your players and make sure that they have some ideas and things that they can pick up on to be able to kind of actually have some sort of footing to get the game rolling. Something that does get a lot of discussion in the D&D community, whether for better or worse, I don't know, but is this whole concept of it's what my character would do. And that is to say that sometimes you as a player may make your character take a decision that might hurt possibly the advancement or the progression of a particular storyline or, or your relationship with a certain group of people or a village or something in some way. And this can be a really complicated and really tricky thing to execute because you know, if you're playing a game with a group of your friends at the table, they might not be so pleased with you kind of actively taking steps that might hinder their progress in a game. But if you've gone ahead and really kind of established what we talked about at the beginning is that this is a collaborative experience and you guys are playing this game together and you've, you've kind of established this, um, the sense that you're, you're, you're playing your character to try to be very true to themselves to do the things that they would do this can actually be one of the most sort of profound and incredible moments of the game. I cannot tell you the amount of, of memorable and incredible moments that have come from a player deciding to do something that is maybe a little bit, you know, of a, of a hindrance to the rest of the group, to the rest of their party, but it's absolutely core and true to the, the core values and, and the beliefs of their players, which is something I've also uh, discuss in, a, in another video as well. When you're in these kinds of moments, you don't want to be making decisions that are in bad faith. And that's really just to say that you're just 
kind of trying to be mean, you're trying to throw your party off course. Good faith decisions that go against the will of your party can be incredible moments, but they should be used sparingly and you shouldn't be, again, actively trying to hurt the progress of your party because remember, the game is a collaborative experience. You're playing with your friends. You don't want to be that guy. So now that your dungeon master has described the scene surrounding you, and you've decided what actions or why your group has decided what actions they want to take, the final step in the process is the DM actually resolving these decisions and these actions in a matter that kind of they see fit, but there is a lot of structure to this process. So once an action has been chosen, it's kind of up to, up to the DM to decide the way that they're going to resolve it. And sometimes the resolution to an action can be something just as simple as, yeah, you head over to the door, you open it, and turns out it's just an empty broom closet. But sometimes the actions that you take can be a lot more complicated and a lot more involved, and they may require something known as an ability check or a roll. I'm not going to go too much into the details of what abilities and stats and all these kinds of things are. If, you have, if you're interested in learning about that, I have done a very detailed uh, video called the, the Character Sheet Explained, where you can find out all the information about how all of that works, how these numbers are determined and generated, and the way that they will actually have an impact in your game. So let's say in this scenario that you are in the middle of some kind of market or fair or something's going on and you decide that you really, really, for whatever reason, want to steal an apple from one of the street vendors. Cool. That's awesome. How do you know whether you succeed or not? And this is what brings us into this third scenario. So if your dungeon master asks you to make a roll or an ability check to see if you can accomplish something or not, there's generally three ways that they can determine whether or not you succeed or fail. The first is to roll against something known as a DC or a difficulty class. This is essentially just how hard something is to do or how hard something is to accomplish. If you roll equal to or higher than that DC or that difficulty class, then you are successful in accomplishing that task. DCs are typically structured in increments of five, with five being very easy, 10 being easy, 15 being medium, 20 being hard, 25 being very hard, and 30 plus being extremely difficult, next to impossible kind of territory. It's definitely important to remember that you can use any number in the middle. A DC of 17 is just as valid as a DC of 10. This is really up to your DM to kind of decide what the level of difficulty of this task is. And that can be a, a little bit of a difficult thing to, to decide or to kind of decipher. The, the DM sets the DC kind of based on the context of you know the, the, the scenario, the surroundings, your character, that have you done these kinds of things before? Is this person, you know, is the person you're trying to steal from magical? Or are they very perceptive? There's a lot of different things that can kind of go into deciding what this DC is. But ultimately in this scenario, if you want to go ahead and try and steal this apple from the street vendor, your, your dungeon master might ask you to roll a sleight of hand check, which is essentially just a way of seeing if you're able to be as discreet and sly enough to, to be able to kind of pocket one of these apples without them noticing. So in this case, you would roll a d20, which is your 20-sided dice, and you would add the modifier that you have next to your sleight of hand ability. And if that number is equal to or higher than the DC that the, the DM has set, then congratulations, you just stole an apple. So the next way that the DM can resolve one of these decisions is through something known as a contested check. So let's say that you're uh, in the middle of a tavern and you decide that you want to have an, an arm wrestling match against one of the other patrons at the bar. The DM might ask you to, to make an athletics check, which will be contested against the athletics check that your dungeon master will roll for this bar patron. And then essentially it's you and your DM rolling against each other and whoever gets the higher number, including any modifiers and anything like that, will be the one who's successful and they will be the one that wins, uh, wins the contest. And the third resolution to your DM asking for a roll is you making what's either called like a passive or a comparison check. And this is very, very similar to rolling against a DC, except it's not decided or determined by your dungeon master. You are essentially rolling your D20, again, adding any necessary modifiers, and you're comparing it against a kind of static number or a number that's already been set. So for example, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the situation where you're trying to steal an apple from the street vendor, you might be rolling your sleight of hand check compared against their passive perception. Passive perception is a stat that's essentially a, a measure of how generally aware a person is. And if again, if you roll that number and it's higher than that character's passive perception, again, congratulations, you just stole an apple. What is super important to remember is that whether you're the DM or the player, a roll is not always required. 
Just like I mentioned before, if sometimes you might just open the door and it's an empty broom closet, or you wanna go steal the apple and no one is paying attention to you because maybe one of your party members decided to, you know, uh, put a distraction on in the, middle of the, in the middle of the road and everyone is looking at that, great. Now you can just steal that apple without even necessarily needing to make any kind of a check. In these kinds of situations, my best recommendation is, and it's something I have recommended and said in other videos before, is to not have your players make a roll for something when that roll will have absolutely no impact on the outcome of their action. And equally, if you're not as prepared for them to roll a 1 as you are for them to roll a 30. If you have a player who's trying to find an artifact inside a house and you ask them to roll an investigation check and they roll a 35 and you say, nope, you didn't find it, what was the point of that roll? What that really kind of does is it strips your player of a lot of feeling of agency and it really doesn't make them feel like they have a lot of control, a lot of power over the situation. But the inverse is also true. You know, if you have your players roll an investigation check to find this artifact in the house and they roll a one and they successfully find it, then again, what was the point of the roll? Again, it just kind of makes them feel like their decisions don't really matter and they would have found it no matter what they do. And it really just kind of makes the game feel a little bit hollow and a little bit empty. All right, so that concludes this section of how to actually play Dungeons, Dungeons and Dragons. We've taken a good deep look at what the, the sort of decision-making tree and how the structure of a game actually works and flows. In future videos, we are going to be discussing a little bit more about the other pillars of the game being social interaction, exploration, and combat, how exactly that whole uh, system ties together. But again, if you did enjoy this video and you want to see more of this type of content, please do leave me a sub to the channel. It does sincerely help. As I said before, I appreciate absolutely every single one. Um, but otherwise, take care.